Okay. Hi, I'm Elaine Brewster. Welcome to Aspects of Energy, a forum where we talk about ways to raise your energy. Today we have a really special guest, Dennis Williams, who is a royal ambassador with the company Miken, and he has been raising people's energy for 30 years, starting this month. Yeah. What, what day was it? The 28th of December, 23rd? December 9th, we, we joined. December 9th. 1991. Well, that's coming up. I would love, Dennis, just to tell us your story, please. Okay. Be glad to. Yeah, it all started for us. You know, I when I got out, got out, of, uh, got out of high school, you know, I was told, like everybody else, you know, go, go to college and get a degree and create a resume and pass it around and get a job at a good company and work your way up and someday retire and live happily ever after so that's what i did and i went to college and did all that stuff and i got a job with uh, del monte foods probably heard of that company and i um uh, i worked for them for 12 and a half years but i got a pretty frustrated with the politics and the drama and and the corporate world you know and, and all the stuff that was going on so anyway we discovered a way to be self-employed so i quit after 12 and a half years and <clears throat> we were self-employed for about 10 years but we didn't really we were independent and everything, but we didn't really have the income that we needed because we had three kids starting college at the same time and everything. So I uh, got in the car business in 1987 and I worked for a, for a Ford dealership as a salesman and I did well there. I mean, I was the salesman of the year every year that I was there. And most of the time I could have left in October and still been salesman of the year. It was very stressful. I mean, I had to work, you know, seven days a week, oftentimes I mean, they let me go to church, but then I had to come back and work in the afternoon. <clears throat> on Sunday, and uh, it was a straight commission, you know, and so it was sometimes, you, you know, you'd be salesman of the month, and then you go from hero to zero and start over again, so it was pretty frustrating, a lot of stress, and then uh, in June of 1991, a complete stranger came walking in to the dealership to tell me about a company called Nikan, and it's a magnetic health products from Japan, well, I'd never heard of that, and I didn't know him, and I just wasn't interested in anything he had to say, he gave me an envelope that was usually you know, a large manila envelope had something in it. I don't know what it was because I never looked. I'd stick up my filing cabinet. He'd come back and I'd hand it back. And this kind of went on. And anyway, he'd come in every couple of weeks. And one day, the over the loudspeakers, the, the magnet man is here to see Dennis again. You know, that was embarrassing. Anyway, <clears throat> I, I, I finally told him, I said, hey, you know, stop bugging me. Go talk to somebody else. And he left. I never thought I would see him, I would see him again. But uh, fortunately for us and, you know, thousands of people, a, a guy was hard of hearing, apparently, he came back in December. And 1991 was a recessionary year. You know, it was not a good year in the car business. And um, I thought it was going to get better, but it got worse. And, and in December, you know, I was on the lot standing out there and I had a bad year and bad day. And, and this guy shows up again and he handed me an audio cassette tape. And I listened to it on the way home and I heard some things on there that kind of got my attention, you know. So <clears throat> I, I called the guy that was on the recording and, and talked to him. He came up to see us. And and uh, anyway, we, we looked at that and thought, you know, this this might be something to this. And we didn't know anything about the products or anything, but my, my younger sister, um, Karen, was a nurse and she heard her back with the patient. She was out of work for about 10 weeks. And uh, and I so I... I this little audio cassette and it was that the guy gave me and it was some product testimonies. And I was playing at my mother's kitchen table one day on a little cassette player. And my sister walked in and heard portions of that. And she said, if this is really true, I'll be forever grateful if it would help me. And I said, well, Karen, I don't even know what it looks like, you know, what, what they're even talking about. So I went over to this guy that was bugging me and said, here's my sister's situation. What do you suggest? And it comes out with the most unlikely looking thing to help someone's back I'd ever seen. You know, it was a backplex. And back in those days, it looked like the mud flap off a motorcycle. It was black on one side, cloth, and a couple of Velcro strips on the other side. And so I took it over to my sister, kind of apologetically, actually, and flipped it over to her and said, here's what the guy said. Put this on your back, you know, put the cloth side against your skin. And anyway, a couple of days later, she was she was not in, dis in discomfort anymore. <clears throat> and she was excited. And, and I was kind of... Uh, amazed actually and then there was a guy down at work that we were selling a truck to and he was in obvious discomfort getting in out of his truck and i didn't know him at all but i went up to him and i said you know it looks like your back's bothering he said oh yeah you know i said let me tell you something about my sister you know it's going to sound kind of strange let me tell you something so i told him about it. he said i'll try anything so i went over and got one of those things from that guy and 
and gave it to him on a, on a Saturday. And uh, Monday morning, his wife called me at work. She said, Mr. Williams, my husband got up this morning, he danced around the kitchen, you know, like a teenager. He said, first time in 20 years, he's felt this good. And I thought, wow. You know, and we heard that you know, eight out of 10 adults have a back problem in this country. I think we may have something that everybody needs and nobody has, I can't buy it anywhere else. And so, you know, that was a marketer's dream, isn't it? So we got pretty excited about it. And so um, anyway, we rejoined and, and um, just started sharing with people. And, and Ruth was on the phone and pretty much anybody that called us or she called, she mentioned it to them, you know, and they'd never heard of it. And of course, and we, so we started setting up a little meeting on a, on a Thursday night there. And uh, every Thursday night, we'd invite people to come over and, and people would come over and they they believe us and they would join and we didn't hardly have any product only half a dozen things you know but but it started to grow and grow and gosh about um, about in February of that just a couple months after that about eight weeks later uh, things were just booming for us and, and I walked into that Ford dealership and told them you know I I I'm not going to work here anymore and they could hardly believe it though that I was going to join the magnet man you know those companies all the time. Anyway, so Ruth was on the phone and she would set up, um, she'd set up meetings for me in different places and, and she'd be talking to somebody and they, they would say, well, you know, and then she'd ask her if they knew anybody in this town or that town. And, and if they did, you know, then she, well, Dennis might be coming through there. And anyway, so she was having me on the road quite a bit there for, you know, and she was organizing and planning things and I was out talking to people and, and it just started to grow and really take off. And uh, it grew very, very fast for us actually in the beginning. And, and uh, a few years later in 1995, we moved to Bashan Island and bought, and bought a home there and some property. And, and then in 1998, we had uh, two young daughters that we adopted after our three older kids had you know, grown up and gone away from, from home. And they were like you know, 10, 11 years old, I guess at that time. And uh, Ruth, Ruth was homeschooling them. And so we decided we'd take an educational trip and make it a business trip too. So we, we had a motor home and, pulled a vehicle behind it and we left home the 2nd of January and uh, headed down the California toward the coast toward California and uh, Ruth had it all planned out she had meetings set up for us uh, during the week you know here and there nothing where we had to hurry and then every Saturday pretty much we were doing a major event in some town somewhere and then we would then we would just travel and, and we'd pull into an RV park and set everything up we got a washer and dryer in the motorhome you know and we hooked everything up and get in the vehicle and take the girls with us and go to do the meeting and visit with people and come back. And we just had a great time. And, and uh, it was also educational, you know, like in Texas, we'd study the Alamo and take the girls to the Alamo. And, and we ended up in Florida and uh, we had a bunch of our friends flew in and we all got on a cruise ship together. <clears throat> we had meetings on the ship. And then we came back to Orlando and spent a week there with the girls at uh, Disney World. And, and then we went up to, uh, Tennessee and went to the Grand Ole Opry. I mean, we just had a ball and the girls were learning things and we were having fun and traveling around and coming back. We stopped at Carlsbad Caverns and went in the caves and everything. And anyway, long story short, uh, on that trip, we drove 11,000 miles and we were in 21 different states and we were gone for three months. And I had one time, I had a one part time employee at home to open the mail and pay the bills. And uh, we came home and found out we were in a um, pretty substantial six-figure income while we were on vacation. So that was pretty awesome. Anyway, we had just a lot of great uh, experiences with, with, with Nick Ken. It's just um, the most rewarding period of time in our entire lives. And, and not just financially, but the friends that we've made, the thank yous you've heard, the lives we've literally seen change for the better. <clears throat> and uh, product-wise, I mean, we've seen miraculous things. And, and I actually believe I owe my life to the, the Nikan Magflex. Um, in 1996, I was in, uh, back, back, back in, uh, where the heck was I? Somewhere in, in, anyway, it didn't matter. I was, I was in some other state back in the Midwest and, and I started getting, you know, numb under my jaw. And I thought, well, it's probably acid reflux or something. And, and uh, so I put the backflex on my chest, that Magflex on my chest. And I should have gone to the doctor, but I came home and I didn't say too much to Ruth. But the next day I went to the little clinic on the island there and I thought, well, I'm not going to wear this in there. So I took it off and laid it in the seat of my pickup and got in there. And anyway, long story short, I ended up in the, getting on an ambulance and going to the ferry and they held it, held, I got there, got me to the hospital on the other side and 
and I ended up having a heart attack in the emergency room. And then, and then a few days later, I had, you know, six-way bypass surgery. And so I, mean, I was good for about 14 years, but I got some bad genetics in my family going. My dad died at 51, my brother died at 34, and my wife died at 56. And so I was the only guy left. And anyway, and uh, I was good for about 14 years. In 2010, I was getting those symptoms again, and it was miraculous how I even got to the hospital. But I had that backpack on my chest, and I forgot it was there. And I was laying in the emergency room. The guy was undressing me to put the leads on for the EKG. And he pulled out, I said, what's this? And I said, that's to keep my blood circulating. And he kind of shrugged his shoulders and threw it in the bag with my clothes. And uh, anyway, they said, well, you're not, that got me wired up and said, you're not having a heart attack. I'm like, oh, good. I'm just a day early from my angiogram because I had one scheduled for the next day. Anyway, five minutes, I called Ruth. She and one of my son-in-laws was on the way over from the island. And I said, I'm doing fine. You know, I'll, I'll see you when you get here. I laid my phone down and Five minutes later, there was this flurry of activity around me. This nurse was gluing defibrillator pads on my chest. And uh, if you have to use those, does it hurt? And she said, yes. And they started to move me. And then I don't remember anything else after that. And then when Ruth got there, she asked for me. And they said, oh, you have to see the social nurse. They said, social nurse? So Ruth went in this private room. And then she came in and said, you can't see your husband right now. I'm sorry, because we're working on him. And Ruth said, what do you mean working on him? She said, well, his heart stopped and we can't get it started. And they were in there pounding on my chest and she was just broke out in hives and you know, it was just pretty dramatic stuff going on. And anyway, somewhere along in there that, you know, the cardiologist showed up and did a uh, catheterization and siphoned the clots out of the, out of the, um, well, one of the bypasses that was, that was, a, was a vein, a vein graft. And they siphoned the clots out of that and put three stents in there, but I was in ICU for five days. Mm. But uh, anyway, I came out of there finally, you know, Oh, the night, uh, this is the night before the, they let me out of the ICU. I guess I was all puffed up, blown up like a balloon from all this stuff, liquids they were shooting in me and everything. But anyway, I had a ventilator down my throat, you know, and I hated that thing. I just, and I kept telling, you know, I, I wanted it out of, they could tell I wanted it out. And, and, and they told Ruth, well, you can't take that out until the swelling goes down his neck. Well, Ruth had a strip of cloth with little pockets in it. You've probably seen that. And those little pockets had, she put those little super minis in there. Yeah, at that time, it was, you know, like today we have, we have power chips. But anyway, put those in there, like six of them, and wrapped it around my neck. And the next morning, the nurses came in. They couldn't believe it. My neck was down to normal. Yeah, it just shrunk right down. And then I went where they put me in the other room. And, and they said, well, how's your sore throat? I said, oh, I have sore throat. And you don't. Most people can't even swallow after having that ventilator down there for five days. <clears throat> and uh, well, that was sore throat. Anyway, when I was in there, Ruth, of course, brought the weekend comforter to me, and I had mag steps in my slippers, you know, my socks, that, and uh, she was bringing me pie water to drink and all the nutrition stuff, sneaking that in there to me. And anyway, they were checking on me every day, and the doctor told me one day, he said, Dennis, he said, you're recovering faster than anybody we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And then they sent me home, and of course, they, I guess they're obligated to send out a home health care lady or something and some exercise physical therapist they made one trip to our house and decided they didn't need, didn't need to come see me anymore <laughs> so i was running up and down the stairs and doing just fine <clears throat> so anyway it's just been such a blessing uh, you know for our family and, and for so many other families all around the world and we just uh, can't imagine doing any, anything else uh, we, we love these products we love the technologies and and that always upgrading things and making things better and new products for us. And um, it's just, a, it's just been a, been a great life. And I encourage anybody that taking a look at it to come aboard and, and enjoy all the benefits that you can have to offer too. Will you tell us about your wall of fame that you <clears throat> had your last house? Yeah, I don't have room for it in this house because it downsized about Sorry. seven years ago and, and moved, you know, that's why we live here in Gig Harbor. But yeah, we had a, we, Back in the day, they used to publish a, a magazine every month, and they would put the pictures of the diamonds and royal diamonds on the cover. And so we would take those uh, pictures and, and put them in a frame. And we had a wall that we put them along the wall. And there were like almost 50 of them on that wall. And uh, people would come to our home to visit, and they'd say, well, who are all these people? You know, they don't look like grandkids. <laughs> and then, uh, the other grandkids are on a different wall, you know. I said, those are just, those are just uh, some of our friends who've helped become millionaires. And they said, what? And, 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 I, and I said, can I be your friend? They would just <laughs> say, <laughs> and they, yeah, yeah, we can always use more friends, you know. 
But uh, yeah, that was pretty special. It was kind of a neat visual there for people to see. Uh, there were because you could tell by looking at them, there were young people, there were older people, there were single people. You know, there were people with a lot of education and people with very little education, and it didn't matter because Nikan gives everybody an equal opportunity to become as unequal as you possibly can. Wow. That's so. an interesting way to, to put it. Yeah, that's true. That's super. Well, Nikan really does help people with that cash flow quadrant that Robert Kiyosaki talks about. Right. Where he, he just, you know, takes a piece of paper and cuts it into four and shows that, like you said, we had been taught to go to college and we've been taught by our families to get a job and be an employee in a good company. Right. And I believe the stats are about 95% of the world, um, or at least of the United States and, well, North America, 95% control 5% of the wealth. Yeah. So basically, pretty much everyone you know doesn't have a lot of money mm -hmm. um, because most of the people are part of that 95%. And so they, they show then, and I guess in the next quadrant is business owners, small business owners. And that's essentially what I am as a voice teacher. I have my own studio and I set my own hours and um, I'll be going to, to Georgia um, on a special event this weekend. And so I had all my students come earlier. But what that also means is if I'm not teaching, I'm not making any money. Right. And that's one of the problems with the small business. And so then in another quadrant is like the franchise owners. So they have found ways to, um, you know, to build on what they're doing, like a, a McDonald's or, you know, or any of those or a Hobby Lobby or you know, Joanne's, Michael's, someone, but that costs a great deal of money. And then the last one are the investors in Robert Kiyosaki's, and they're the ones that control 95% of the money. Yeah, and it takes That's money to, to, to be an investor too. And then there's no guarantee there either. Well, and I guess that's one of the nice things about this company is it doesn't take a lot of money to join or even to buy the products so that you can have those experiences like you have had with your legs, with that guy's back, with your sister's back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a perfect it's a perfect business. I mean it's it's not it's not maybe it's not you know no business really perfect, but it's better than anything else out there, I guarantee you. Wow. Well, thank you for all your service that you've done to all of us, not just your 50 millionaires, but to all of us. And right, thank you're you welcome, for being on today. I really appreciate it. You're a good friend, Dennis. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right. We'll see you all later. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.